Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel wherever you are in the world and so much love to each and every one of you. I do hope you're doing fabulous, I'm doing great, thank you very much. And I hope you're keeping warm and go and get yourself that lovely hot cup of cocoa or whatever it is you drink because we're on part three of our story. And by all means, share the story with anybody else because it's really lovely for other people to hear about these stories. So let's get started, shall we? Look, Miss Mackenzie. Sorry, Gladys. It's very generous of you to offer to help my son Howie out. But why should you be put to this trouble on his account? I'm sure me and the wife can easily organise some extra tuition for him. You have a long, hard day at school every day. I certainly don't envy the mountain of work you teachers have to get through. You can't possibly be expected to go out of your way on my son's account to tutor him. It's very kind of you to offer, though. Very kind indeed. And I appreciate it very much. I will discuss this matter with my wife when she returns from tennis. We will both decide together what needs to be done about this matter. I'm incredibly grateful, Miss Mackenzie, for putting me well into the picture. Oh, it's only a pleasure, Simon, purred Miss Mackenzie. Look, I'm telling you, it's no trouble to give your son extra lessons. He so obviously needs them. It's what I do. I dedicate my life to teaching. I'm incredibly fond of your son, Simon. I, for one, would love to see him thrive and flourish at school, so he can accomplish much in his future. He has so much potential. The trouble is that laziness is his biggest vice, and a failure to focus seems to have set him back a great deal. It seems a dreadful pity he's lagging behind all the other pupils in his class. What can I say, Simon? With a few nips here and a few tucks there, I'm quite sure I can whip your son into shape, and I would be delighted to help you in that regard, in any way I can. As far as I'm concerned, it would be an absolute pleasure to help Howard. Besides, nobody knows the school curriculum better than I do myself. What the hell, I thought, as I eavesdropped on my father's conversation with my math teacher, Miss Mackenzie. The woman was confessing to like me. Are you kidding me? She abhorred me, but she was certainly trying to charm the socks off my father. She seemed to be acting like she had my best interests at heart, when she had never given a fig about me before. Please, God, I thought, don't let my dad accept her offer. Please, no. I don't want to be stuck with that witch doing math. This is an absolute nightmare. I wish she had come here to yell at my father about the stunt I'd pulled in class today. That would be infinitely better than all of this. To all intensive purposes, the thought of having extra math lessons with Miss Mackenzie after school was brutal to say the very least, and I certainly wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. Well, Gladys, now that you put it like that, how can I possibly refuse your generous offer? In the light of what you say, and how well you know the school curriculum, I would very much like you to tutor my son, but we must insist on paying you for your trouble. Otherwise, I'm going to have to refuse your offer. Well, if you insist, that would be very nice. But it's not the money I'm concerned about, Simon. It's your son's future that I'm concerned about. I want that young man to make the very best of his life. I care very passionately about all my pupils. If they do well in school, it always reflects favourably on me as a teacher. I was so relieved when Miss Mackenzie finally left our house. I thought that woman would never leave. I hurriedly retreated back to my bedroom, with the stealth and cunning of a fox. I pretended to be focusing on my math homework, which was an absolute farce, as I was vacuously staring at an empty page in my exercise book and chewing the back of my pen. When I heard the knock at the door, I knew, of course, that it was my father, and I knew what he was going to tell me. "'Come in,' I said." My father stood in the doorway, looking a tad uncomfortable. Howie, just so you know, we've had a visitor at the house. You probably heard the doorbell ringing, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Well, it was your math teacher, Miss Mackenzie. She popped around to see me. I understand that you've been really struggling with math and are lagging behind the rest of the class. 
Miss Mackenzie is terribly concerned about your poor progress. I get the impression your math grades are pitiful, Howie. And that's not good. This can't go on. It just can't. Miss Mackenzie seems like a very nice lady. I've never met her before, as it's your mother who goes and sees the teachers on parents' evening. But Miss Mackenzie wanted you to know that she's very concerned about you, Howie. She says you have an inclination to being very lazy. She thinks you're a lot cleverer than you pretend to be. And the only reason your math is so bad is you simply don't want to apply yourself, because you find math boring. I think she's right about that. Miss Mackenzie is lying to you, Dad. All right, I admit it. Math is my least favourite subject in school, and I absolutely hate it. But I'm not the bottom of the class. I'm doing reasonably okay. Howie, I'm sorry, but okay is not good enough. Me and your mother want the very best for you. We want you to achieve things in life. It all starts with getting great grades at school. You're doing well in all your other subjects. You don't need your failure to succeed in math to drag you down. I wholeheartedly agree with Miss Mackenzie on this. It's not that you're incapable of doing math. Far from it, in fact. It's just you hate it so much that you refuse to focus. That's a lousy attitude to have, son. It really is. We all have to do things in life we don't enjoy. There are people out there going to a job every day they absolutely abhor. But they know they need to put food on the table, so they do the job anyway. Nobody ever said life was like a free ride. Numeracy is very important, son. Everybody knows that. The good news is, Howie, is that your kind teacher, Miss Mackenzie, has agreed to tutor you three nights a week here at the house at six o'clock in the evening. I have accepted her gracious offer and have decided you can do your work with her in the downstairs study. Dad, I don't need extra help with my math. I'm doing fine, I promise you. If you don't make me take extra lessons with Miss Mackenzie, I really will apply myself this time. I promise you I will. My father raised a cynical brow. I'm sorry, Howie. You're not doing fine. That's obvious. Otherwise, your teacher wouldn't have paid us an extra special visit. You clearly need extra help. And you're going to get it whether you like it or not. My decision is made up. But I hate Miss Mackenzie, Dad. She's horrible. You have no idea what she's really like. She's an evil witch. Nobody at school likes her at all. She's super weird, as is her strange brother Elk. Everybody laughs at her behind her back, and she's got no friends. I don't want to hear any more of this from you, son. How dare you speak unkindly of a very generous woman who is going out of her way to help you, out of the sheer goodness of her heart. She's making sacrifices on your account. You should be ashamed of yourself. She takes full responsibility as a teacher. She's very, very serious about you needing to do well. She wants you to succeed in life. Where on earth is your gratitude, son? Miss Mackenzie. Miss Mackenzie sat in her beige Mazda car. She stared up at the prepossessing, very distinguished-looking white Georgian farmhouse, with its rather lovely red front door and sash windows that twinkled back at her in the late afternoon sun. Simon Roxborough, who was bidding her goodbye, was still standing in the arched doorway of his home. He waved to her. She lifted up her hand in response to wave back at him, and then very reluctantly she started up the engine to drive back home. She briefly held one hand to her chest for a moment, feeling the pulsating throbbing of her delicate heartbeat, which was rapidly racing a dime to a dozen. Goodness gracious me, it was hot in the car. But she wasn't thinking about the heat concerning the searing temperatures of late, which had been pretty unforgivable. She was thinking more about the heat in her body that her impromptu meeting with Mr. Roxburgh had generated within her. It was a spark that could not be put out. Miss Mackenzie was completely bowled over by the beguiling charms of Mr. Roxburgh, who would have ever thought that the most obnoxious student in the entire school, Howard Roxburgh, would actually have a heartthrob for a father. She had come to see the Roxburghs today, to tell them all about their son's deplorable behaviour in class and how he needed to learn some good manners. 
She hoped her unexpected off-the-cuff visit with the Roxburghs would mean that their objectionable son would be dealt with and hopefully severely punished for the stunt he'd pulled on her earlier on that day, which had made her the laughing stock in the class. She had very pleasing visions of Mr. Roxburgh pulling off his belt from around his middle. She imagined it to be a belt with a large metal buckle, so it would hurt a lot more when Mr. Roxburgh used it on his son. She had imagined Mr. Roxburgh thrashing Howard's back so very hard, so that by the time he came to school the next day, that weasel would barely be able to walk, and hopefully the wheels caused from his father's thrashing would sting for weeks on end. She wanted Howard to be punished severely for humiliating her so much in front of that entire class. No one does that to me and gets away with it, had been her vicious mantra that she had entertained as she drove her Mazda furiously to the Roxburgh's house, with only vengefulness and spite on her mind. Things had not panned out quite as she had expected them to. Far from it, in fact. She had believed that both Ashley and her husband Simon would be at home, but instead she had met Simon Roxburgh for the first time in her life. She had become unduly flustered over her encounter with a devilishly handsome man. The smile of his was so disarming it could melt butter on a winter's day. And she had left Mr. Roxburgh's house with a spring in her step, feeling as infatuated by the man as a teenager over an illustrious film star. Miss Mackenzie had not mentioned to Simon Roxburgh what had really happened in class that morning with the pond water and tadpoles, as somehow she had not felt right about mentioning the matter any more, as Simon Roxburgh might think she was being petty. Instead, she had generously found herself offering Howard extra tuition and profusely going on and on about his potential to succeed in math if he applied himself, which was highly exaggerated, of course. In truth, Miss Mackenzie doubted very much that Howard could possibly be good at anything. He was the most annoying pupil in the entire school. But the dynamics had significantly shifted, as Howard so happened to have a father that was so good-looking he had almost stolen her breath away. The idea of offering Howard Roxburgh extra tuition had suddenly swung into her mind like a pendulum when she masterfully thought of an ingenious way she could see more of Simon Roxburgh. And the best way to do it was through his son Howard, by offering him extra math lessons. It was a good thing he was so bad at math. Who would have thought in a million months of Sundays that her most deplorable pupil at the school would lead her straight to her Prince Charming? She'd always known he was out there somewhere, and now she'd found him. Miss Mackenzie wiped away the sweat that had gathered on her brow, as just thinking about Mr. Roxburgh made her incredibly hot. No one had ever had this effect on her before. Even the name Simon melted on her tongue like butter over a bagel. Oh, dearie me, what am I like, she thought. She had never felt so flustered in all her life. The attraction she felt towards Simon Roxburgh was insatiable. She had never felt such a delicious feeling before that made every single cell in her body tingle with electric shocks. This must be what it feels like to fall in love, she thought. Who would have thought that would ever happen to her? I thought I was immune to love, but I'm obviously not. I'm in love, she told herself firmly. I'm in love with the most handsome man that I've ever had the privilege to meet. I'm going to make him mine, come hell or high water. Too bad there's an annoying wife in the way. But the likes of Ashley Roxburgh, well, she can be easily dealt with. Miss Mackenzie had always been a spinster and never considered getting married before. That had never even entertained her mind. As far as she was concerned, men were more trouble than they were worth. But Simon Roxburgh had changed everything. The man was absolutely gorgeous. He had seized her undivided attention and enabled her heart to do pirouettes in a true ballerinic style. She loved the feeling of being so vital, so alive, so animated. She'd never felt like this before. In Simon Roxburgh's presence, she felt as giddy as a teenager with a crush on a film star. She knew that Simon's face would be permanently entrenched in her mind. She liked it that way as his was the only face she wanted to see. Oh, goodness gracious me, those eyes of his were to die for. There were soft brown flecks of green and gold dancing around his iris. 
I've never seen eyes like that before. And when Simon smiles at me the way he does, his mouth twitches up at the corners in a lopsided grin. It made my heart almost skip a beat. There's definitely something between us, Miss Mackenzie decided to herself. He felt it too. I'm most sure he did. Our meeting today was preordained. She no longer felt aggrieved about the pond water and tadpoles incident in class. As without it, she might never have met Howard's father. She'd happily drink more of that dirty pond swill with tadpoles if she could wake up every morning to find Simon Roxburgh lying at her side in his king-size bed. She shivered in delight as she envisaged that hunk of a man with his large shoulders holding her close to his chest. So close, in fact, that she'd hear his heart beat and gladly inhale his all-male musky scent. She'd brush her hand over his five o'clock shadow. I'm going to make him mine, she firmly decided. We're meant to be together, and if he can't see it, I'll make him see it myself. Miss Mackenzie lived with her twin brother, Elk. They'd lived together for years and years. She thought he was as dim as a blown-out light bulb, but that couldn't be helped. He had his uses, of course, and she took full advantage of them. She would conveniently get him to do all the donkey work for her. The great thing about having a brother who was a half-wit, well, you could get him to practically do almost anything you wanted, without so much as a buy or leave. The poor simpleton was as malleable as putty in her hands. The only time Elk had ever stood up to her was upon his insistence in getting those awful tattoos done all over his body. She had told him, in no uncertain terms, how dreadfully unsightly they were, but that was the only time he had not cared for her opinion. Miss Mackenzie thought about that annoying roadblock in her path that threatened to come between her and Simon Roxburgh, that woman Ashley Roxburgh, who was married to the man. Yes, she was a problem that needed to be dealt with, but who said the course of true love ever ran smooth? When obstacles stood in your pathway, you needed to remove them. Everybody knew that. Miss Mackenzie tried to remember what Ashley Roxbury looked like. The woman must be rather unremarkable and nondescript, she thought, if she doesn't even come into my mind. She thought with a small measure of satisfaction. Then suddenly she recalled the fresh-faced, rather pretty woman with the dark hair and auburn highlights that had asked her earnestly about Howie's performance in school at a recent parents' evening. Oh, that was Ashley. Hello! I'm Ashley Roxburgh, and you must be Miss Mackenzie. I am so delighted to meet you. I'm Victoria and Howard's mother. She shook Miss Mackenzie's hand rather warmly. I want to talk about my children with you. The memory was steadily coming back to Miss Mackenzie's mind, like a light suddenly being switched on in the passageway of her head. What was it she had said to Mrs. Roxburgh? It was all coming back to her now. "'Well, your daughter Victoria, I'm pleased to say, is a delight to teach, Mrs. Roxburgh. An absolute delight. She pays full attention in class and is my best pupil.' Ashley's Roxburgh's face had lit up like a Christmas tree to hear that. She enjoyed hearing the praises of her daughter. "'And Howie?' she had asked more tentatively. "'How is my son getting on with his math?' "'Not well, I'm afraid, Mrs. Roxburgh. I wish I could say differently, but I can't.' "'Your son is failing to concentrate. "'He's very different to your daughter, I'm afraid. "'He doesn't concentrate in class at all. "'I find him daydreaming a lot, looking out of the window. "'I thought you would say that,' said Ashley, hanging her head sadly. "'The trouble with my son, Howie, well, he gets terribly bored easily. "'I know he doesn't enjoy numeracy in the least. "'He finds it so boring. "'That's not an excuse, Mrs. Roxburgh.' If your son paid more attention in class, I'm quite sure his grades would significantly improve. I'll speak to him, Miss Mackenzie. See what I can do to get him out of this mindset of his. Elk. Elk knew he wasn't the brightest brick in the block. His sister Gladys Mackenzie was continuously telling him that. But he knew he wasn't stupid either. Yes, he was unfortunately born with water on the brain. But as far as Elk was concerned... He was as bright as the next man. Different, maybe, but just as bright nevertheless. He wouldn't, of course, tell his sister Gladys that, for she'd have never agreed. 
Besides, she called him hair-brained, stupid, and dim-witted all the time. Gladys was permanently reminding him of how grateful he should be that she was there to look after him and to supervise his every need. He was grateful, of course, he was for her intervention in his life, but Elk knew how to look after himself. Gladys seemed to think Elk was dependent on him, but he considered himself to be pretty much self-sufficient. Sometimes Gladys would frighten him. She could be very snappy when she wanted to be. And condescending to boot, Gladys could so quickly fly off the handle when things didn't come up to her exacting standards. Elk knew that Gladys was clever. She was very good at math, which she taught at the local high school. But Elk did not know much about her job, nor did he want to either. He was sure it was tediously boring, as certainly being cooped up indoors teaching teenagers math was not a good life as far as Elk was concerned. Despite the fact that his sister worked in a social environment, she had never managed to make any friends at the school. But Elk was glad about that. He didn't like people intruding in their lives. Elk was socially withdrawn and found it exceedingly difficult to communicate with people. When he was around and about in town, people often gave him funny looks. Elk knew it was because he wasn't like other people, so he was not comfortable around strangers. Besides, as far as he was concerned, they couldn't exactly be trusted. Well, Gladys had told him as much anyway. Elk spent hours in the countryside, exploring the woodgrove, and in his spare time he carved woodland animals out of wood to sell at a local curio shop in town. They were always incredibly popular with the visitors to the state. Elk also knew the name of every single woodland tree or flowering shrub that grew in the woods, for the natural world was his quintessential playground, and Elk certainly understood the cycles of nature like the back of his own hand. The lion's share of his time was always spent in the great outdoors, where he had learnt so much about nature. Elk knew his sister had returned from school in a very truculent mood that day, muttering under her breath something about tadpoles and dirty pond water, and how she'd like to wring Howard's neck, whoever Howard was, and have him hung, drawn and quartered. One way or another, she would make him pay. Elk assumed Howard must be one of Gladys's students, and whatever that poor student had done in class that day, it had clearly caused his sister great upset. "'I won't be humiliated! I just won't!' she kept saying over and over again, as if those were the words to a new song she was learning off by heart. Elk reasoned that tonight would be a night when he'd have to buckle up and face the storm of his sister's belligerent wrath. For when she was pugnaciously disagreeable like this, there was no telling how many times she'd call him a dimwit. Elk was surprised that no sooner had his sister Gladys returned home, in her clapped-out Mazda, which was parked in their run-down carport, that she appeared to be going out again, storming off to her car in quite the huff, muttering furiously under her breath, something about tadpoles and the boy called Howard that she'd been going on about before. But Elk could not make out exactly what she was saying. But he guessed whatever it was, it certainly wasn't nice. I'm just going out, Elk. I'll be back very shortly, she called after him. I'm popping around to see a student's parent about their son's deplorable behaviour in class today. They live down the road from here, in that grand Georgian house. Elk knew the place reasonably well that she was talking about, although he'd never seen it close up, so he nodded. He watched his sister strutting to her car, like an angry female peacock. Whatever this Howard had done, he had really made his sister as mad as hell, and Elk felt rather sorry for the boy called Howard, as he knew what it was like to be on the receiving end of his sister's indignant moods, and he wouldn't wish that on anyone. That day, things were very strange as far as Elk was concerned. He was rather bewildered when the Gladys that set off to see the student's parents in a very disagreeable mood was not exactly the same Gladys that returned home quite a while later. The metamorphosis in his sister's demeanour was dramatic to say the least. She literally left looking like an angry pit bull, but she had morphed into a lovable little spaniel. Not that there had ever been anything remotely lovable about his sister Gladys. Gladys had sauntered through the front door, looking almost animated, happy even, as if she'd received some very good news. 
Maybe she'd won some money on the lottery, Elk could not help but think. And if she had, she'd likely not share it with him. Was his sister humming to herself? Elk had never heard Gladys hum before. She looked so decidedly pleased with herself. Her grey skin had taken on a flushed look, as if it was dappled with a rosy glow. Gladys barely acknowledged him, as she brushed past him brusquely in the entrance hall, like a tree in the grove. She stopped in front of the hall mirror to examine her reflection more closely. Then she asked Elk a very strange question. Elk, do you think I am pretty? Elk didn't want to tell his sister that no, she wasn't remotely pretty. That would be a very rude thing to say. Besides, it would make Gladys decidedly angry. Elk didn't want to upset his cantankerous sister. She could turn nasty if she wanted to, and Elk did not like it when Gladys was mean. On one occasion she had grabbed him so hard by the arm and led him into the bathroom. She had forced him to wash his mouth out with soap and water. She had told him his words had been dirty, so his mouth needed a good cleaning out. He had only told Gladys that her glasses made her look like an owl, and that had provoked his sister to rage. Elk liked owls. He couldn't understand why Gladys was so upset when he told her she looked like an owl wearing those glasses. The soapy water had tasted really horrible on his tongue. Then there was another time when his sister had poured a bucket of ice-cold water over his head. She'd laughed out loud at him when he begged her to stop. As more and more buckets of that ice-cold water were flung at him mercilessly, he had stood there like a prize lemon as Gladys had thrown the icy water at him, drenching him so that he was soaked to the skin. Then there had been another time after that was when his sister Gladys had locked him up in the closet for two whole days. He was a big man. It had been insufferably dark, claustrophobic and pokey in that closet, so much so that he could barely breathe. His long legs got terrible cramps, as he'd taken up all the space in that small closet. Elk had been so scared, as Gladys had spitefully not given him any food or water for those two days, and he desperately needed to go to the toilet, and had been so desperate he'd wet himself, and when Gladys had discovered his humiliation, she had told him he was absolutely disgusting. Elk seemed to fail to realise he could easily overpower his sister, given his large size and his bulging biceps. Most people would fight back if a hundred-pound woman locked them up in a closet, and they were three times her size, but Elk did everything his sister expected him to do, as it had always been that way, and he didn't know any different. I asked you, Elk, a question, and I would appreciate an answer if you don't mind. Am I pretty? Um, uh, I, I think maybe you are, said Elk rather dimly, taking good care to avoid Gladys's burning gaze. Since when had his sister ever asked him his opinion over anything? Gladys never cared about his feelings. She always thought he was so stupid, but it would seem right now... She needed her vanity stroking, and Elk didn't have the first clue how to do that for her. I'm thinking of having auburn highlights put in my hair, Elk. Ashley Roxburgh has auburn highlights, you know. She said this more to herself than to Elk. Who is Ashley Roxburgh? He asked, feeling sure he'd heard the name mentioned before. You didn't easily forget a surname like that. Did the Roxburghs not live in that fancy Georgian house? down the road, that his sister went and visited moments before. Never you mind, Elk. More to the point, do you think auburn highlights would suit my skin tone? I, I don't know, said Elk, looking at his sister with his jaw gaping wide open. He'd never seen Gladys suddenly show so much interest in her own physical appearance. What was going on with her? Elk didn't like the way Gladys was behaving. She was forty-one years old, for goodness sake. She was acting like she was a sixteen-year-old teenager who had a crush on a boy. All the questions she was asking Elk were rather bothersome, to say the least. How on earth was he expected to know the answers to give her? It was so much better when a few words were only exchanged between the two of them, which was usually the case. He preferred it that way, as both he and his sister didn't usually communicate much. But all these questions rarely began to irk him. Elk liked a quiet, unassuming, rather demure life, with a few grunts exchanged here and there between him and his sister. But this long-drawn-out conversation 
he was having with her was not his kind of thing at all. If Elk had hoped his sister Gladys's behaviour would revert back to normal, that was wishful thinking on his part. One day he got quite the shock when she'd returned home looking decidedly different. For a moment Elk didn't recognise his sister and thought a stranger was visiting their house, and that had upset him greatly, so he'd run into the house to hide from this visitor. He was soon to realise the stranger was no other than his sister Gladys, but he'd barely recognised her. It turned out his sister had been to the hairdressers in town for a full makeover. Her braid had been cut off. Her hair had been done in sumptuously thick, rather flattering layers, with auburn and hazelnut highlights. The new look his sister sported really did do wonders for her hard features and her angular pointed face. It certainly made her look a lot more feminine. Even her bird-like nose was less conspicuous, and the tones of her hair did appear to make her dark eyes look less hostile. Within days, Elk observed that his sister's wardrobe had undergone a huge overhaul. She was now wearing pretty feminine dresses and skirts, the likes of such she'd never owned before. She even wore lipstick on her lips, in a bright crimson colour. Elk barely noticed his sister's lips before, because they were so desperately thin. But the strangest thing of all is his sister had been buying items from that naughty shop in town, where the mannequins brazenly paraded themselves in skimpy underwear in the window. Every time he and his sister had walked past that shop, called the Foxy Lady, Gladys had always instructed Elk very firmly to keep his eyes shut. There are some things you don't want to see, Elk, because they will pollute your mind with filth, and goodness knows what else. Elk thought there must be something bad about the shop, if his sister Gladys didn't want him to look at what the models were wearing. But now she was buying some of the stuff to wear herself, which he thought was decidedly odd. Elk had seen the bags with the logo's foxy lady on the outside that his sister had brought home and piled up in the entrance hall. There were so many of them. He had been shocked to see the silken woman's underwear folded between layers of crisp tissue paper. He thought his sister liked big, beige, sensible bloomers. She always wore that kind. They hung on the washing line for years. They were strong, resilient, plain and ugly. If the truth be told, that's what she always wore. Why were things different now? Why was she buying small lacy knickers that were so incredibly fragile they looked like they might fall apart after a couple of rigorous washes in the front loader? His sister of late was becoming decidedly strange, and Elk could not figure her out at all. These days she seemed so preoccupied all the time, as if her mind was thousands and thousands of miles away. Elk knew that three days a week his sister would drive down the long dirt road in her Mazda to that sequestered big Georgian house that was owned by the Roxburgh family. When she went to that house, she always seemed to return in an incredibly good mood. She would always leave the house dressed up to the nines in one of the pretty dresses she had purchased, as if she was going out on the town to a special occasion, when in fact she was just tutoring a student called Howard to help him improve his grades. When Gladys returned home, the annoying humming would start up all over again, as if his sister had become a night cricket. You think he'd be pleased that his sister was more upbeat these days, but that was not the case. Elk observed that Gladys, his sister, was ignoring him a lot these days, and that had to be a good thing. He rather liked that. But it was her paradoxical, rather bizarre antics that made him feel increasingly uncomfortable. His sister appeared to have become someone else, someone he barely recognised. Elk would have preferred Gladys to be putting him down, calling him a dimwit, ridiculing him all the time. He was well used to that. Elk liked his daily life to be predictable, not complicated by the element of change. He believed that change muddied the waters, causing confusion, and nothing was more bewildering than watching his sister Gladys behaving so weirdly. Elk would watch Gladys twirling around in front of the mirror for hours on end, modelling a brand new dress that she'd bought in town and she was forever annoyingly asking him how she looked, and he'd never known what to answer. Elk didn't care what his sister looked like, and neither had she even bothered about her appearance until very recently, when she started visiting the Roxburgh house. 
He knew his sister was giving extra math lessons to a student living in the grand Georgian house called Howard Roxburgh. She claimed he was incredibly stupid. Well, he must be stupid, Elk thought to himself, to need so much extra help with all his math. These days it seemed like his sister practically lived at the Roxburgh home, or at the very least she appeared to want to live there, judging by the way she kept behaving. One day Gladys returned home from the Roxburgh house in a bad, truculent mood that was very conspicuous. Elk had not seen her like that for a long time. Indeed, he'd seen stormier skies that had looked less menacing than his sister did right now. Gladys began to kick at the doors in the kitchen. A couple of them flew off their hinges. Then a glass pane in the kitchen cracked, when Gladys cursed under her breath and threw a mug in the air, so that the coffee splattered all over the wall, and jagged pieces of broken china lay haphazardly across the floor that Elk knew he'd have to clean up. Gladys stomped around the house like an angry bison as she began kicking everything in sight, and by the looks of things she had a vendetta against the sofa, the wing chair in the lounge, the mahogany coffee table, and one of the bookshelves in the hallway. "'How can this be happening?' she shrieked. "'I don't bloody believe it! I don't! What the hell am I going to do?' When his sister had caught Elk staring at her, through frightened wide eyes, she had snorted. "'What are you staring at, Elk? Never seen anyone letting off steam, have you? You're a stupid, gormless idiot. Get out of here, will you? I can't bear the sight of you. I need my space. I need to think.' Elk didn't dare ask his sister what was going on with her, but he knew he'd find out soon enough, and he sure did. It would seem Howard Roxburgh was doing remarkably well in math, Gladys's extra tuition services had paid off and were no longer required at the Roxburgh household. According to the Roxburghs, Miss Mackenzie had done an outstanding job in getting their sons Howard's grades up to scratch, and it appeared that he was now getting top marks in class. Miss Mackenzie had obviously done a good job with a stupid student, Elk thought. She should be pleased by her accomplishments, but pleased she most certainly was not. Elk could see his sister was decidedly upset. He worked out pretty quickly for himself. It was because she couldn't go to the Roxburgh household any more. It would seem Gladys really liked going over to the Roxburgh house to give her pupil extra tuition, which was why she'd always dress up and leave the house smelling like a sweet bouquet, with red lipstick on her lips, looking happier than he'd ever seen her look before. With Gladys no longer visiting the Georgian house, at the other end of the dirt road, Elk had all but noticed that Gladys had become increasingly petulant, moody and capricious. She was snapping at him tirelessly, calling him an imbecile all the time. At long last, the old Gladys he'd always known and found it difficult to love was finally back, which for Elk was reassuring. One day Gladys told Elk that she had a very important job she wished for him to do. Elk rather liked the sound of that as his sister had never asked him to do anything important before, so this was a first. "'We are going to bring Mrs. Roxburgh, Howard's mother, home to live with us, Elk. "'But I don't understand. Does she not live in that fancy house down the road?' Elk pointed out innocently. "'Why would she want to live here?' "'We're bringing her to live here, Elk. But it's a big, big secret. No one must know that she's living with us. Do you understand? You can't tell anybody about this.' Not that you would, of course, because you never speak to people. But it's our special secret. You're good at keeping secrets, aren't you, Elk? I suppose so, said Elk, his jaw dropping wide open. But why are you bringing her here? he asked. Why all these questions, Elk? I told you why I'm bringing her here. Why are you such a dimwit? Why don't you listen properly to anything I tell you? Yes, she is moving in with us for good. You, Elk, are going to lock her up in the spare bedroom for me. You will bring her here during the day while I'm teaching at school. You will take a quick shortcut through the woods and carry her here, making sure that nobody sees you. She's not a heavy woman, probably 20 pounds heavier than I am. You're a strong man. That's not going to be a problem for the likes of you. You are to leave her in that bedroom en suite, with the door safely locked. Is that understood? There is no way you can let her out. 
So that's why you got me to put bars on the outside windows and a security to one. Gladys smiled. Goodness gracious me, Elk, I am impressed. You're not as stupid as you look, you know. Yes, you put all that security up for me so that that woman cannot escape. I've prepared the room very nicely for her to make herself comfortable. There's snacks in the room, water, toiletries, and there's a bathroom. There's nothing that she could possibly need. But we can't have anything in that room that she can use to hurt us with. We'll ply her with sedatives to keep her calm. Is that understood? And give her lots of books to read to keep her preoccupied and entertained. But I can't bring her here. I don't even know her. You know I don't talk to strangers. She lives in that big fancy house on the edge of the woods at the bottom of the road. Why would she ever want to live here? Because she will want to live here. That's why. And because I say so. Now, do you want to do something important for your sister, or don't you? What must I do? Have I not already told you, Elk, what I want you to do? Or were you not listening, you dimwit? How many times am I supposed to repeat myself? When I'm at school teaching, you're to go to the Roxburgh household and knock on the door, and Mrs. Roxburgh will answer the door. That's what you're supposed to do. But why would I want to do that? Because I say so, Elk, and when I say something and tell you to do it, I expect you to do it. Elk nodded. Mrs. Roxburgh will be at home. When she answers the door, I want you to grab her. Put this injection into her arm as quickly as you can. But why must I do that? It's not nice sticking a needle in the arm. It can hurt. Oh, don't you worry about Mrs. Roxburgh, Elk. I'm sure she's had lots of injections before over the years. She's a big girl, isn't she? She won't mind a needle. The injection will make her woozy, very sleepy. You must carry her through the woods to bring her back to the house to ensure you're not seen. You don't want her kicking and screaming and making a commotion, do you? That's why you need to give her the injection. She'll only draw attention to you, if you don't. Luckily, this is a sequestered area. But you still need to be very careful and vigilant. Now I will show you how to inject her. We will practice on some raw chicken, and you'll soon get the hang of it. It's not that hard, I can assure you. You will bring that sleeping woman back here at once. She'll fall asleep very quickly the moment you've stabbed her with the injection. That's the idea. When you bring her back to the house, I want you to put her on the bed so that she can continue to have her sleep. You will then lock the door behind her. She's got everything she can possibly need for the next few days or so. Water, food, plenty of toiletries. I've even left her some of my old clothes she can wear. She'll be absolutely fine. We're not treating her badly, Elk. We're just keeping her locked away in that room. But I can't do that. I'm scared. I don't speak to people, especially not strangers. And I don't like sticking needles into people's arms. And I don't like the idea of locking her in the room. I don't think it's nice to lock people up. Don't you worry. I can assure you she is going to be fine. Don't be overreactive about this, Elk. Don't you want me to be proud of you? Don't you want to show me that you're not a gormless idiot after all? That maybe you're not as stupid as I've always thought you were? Don't you want to prove me wrong about that? Elk was far from happy. He couldn't understand why his sister Gladys wanted him to bring Mrs. Roxburgh to live at their house with them. It made no sense to him at all. But there was no point in arguing with Gladys. He knew he could refuse his sister nothing. He had to go along with this strange, nonsensical game of hers. It would seem bringing a strange lady to live at their house in the spare room made things so much more complicated for him. He wished things could go back to normal, but his sister was at it again, behaving strangely. Elk had done exactly as his sister Gladys had demanded of him. It had been a lot easier than he had anticipated. He had felt a tad nervous about knocking on Mrs. Roxburgh's front door. He didn't like meeting strangers at the best of times, but the kind lady had been awfully nice towards him and had not looked at him in a funny way like some people did. Elk had never seen the Roxburgh's home close up and personal, 
It was so very different to the grey drab building where he lived with his sister Gladys. Everything about this house was beautiful. Hedges were pruned elegantly. The grass moaned to absolute perfection. Colourful summer flowers proudly tumbled out of terracotta pots. Everything was beguilingly pretty. Elle could not help but admire the gleaming bright red polished front door. The one he and Gladys had at home was badly scratched up and in disrepair. He heard the female voice inside saying, I'm coming, won't be a second. And then the door abruptly swung open. And that was when Elk first laid eyes on Mrs. Roxburgh. She smelt so nice, of lemons, he thought. She was a pretty woman. She had auburn hues in her dark hair. And Elk liked that very much. Maybe this is why his sister Gladys was so determined to get her own auburn highlights done but she could never look as fetching or as pretty as Mrs. Roxburgh did. "'Hello there,' said Mrs. Roxburgh, unable to hide her surprise in seeing Elk standing at the front doorstep. She knew this was Miss Mackenzie's twin brother, who everyone described as a simpleton. What on earth was he doing on her front doorstep, looking rather like a stray dog that was looking for a new home? The big, bulky, strapping man was wearing a red plaid shirt, he had a long ponytail. He looked exceedingly uncomfortable, as if the last place in the world he wanted to be was standing on her front doorstep. Maybe he needed help, she thought. Had Miss Mackenzie had a fall or something, were the first thoughts that came flying into Mrs. Roxburgh's head. I know who you are. You're Elk, isn't that right? You're Gladys Mackenzie's twin brother. I thought I recognised you. "'Goodness gracious me, this is a surprise!' Elk nodded. "'That's right, ma'am. I am Gladys's twin brother.' "'You are the one that makes those delightful carved curios in town, "'all those animals out of wood. "'You really are talented to make those. "'I buy them quite regularly, you know, as gifts for friends, "'for people who live out of state, because they love them so much. "'I particularly like the key rings you make.' "'Is everything all right at home?' asked Mrs. Roxburgh, looking concerned. "'Miss Mackenzie is all right, is she not?' Elk nodded, and then with an act of courageous boldness, he pulled his hand out of his pocket and lunged forward, stabbing the injection into Mrs. Roxburgh's arm. Elk felt really bad, as it must have hurt to stab Mrs. Roxburgh like this. She cried out for a second, gave him a funny look, then her eyelids started to close. She almost lost her balance.' but Elk caught her in time. She was like a flagging flower in the meadow after a scorching hot day that had just about had enough. Elk stopped her fall gently and then lifted the woman in his arms. She was light. She probably did weigh a 120 pounds, as his sister had said she would. She was easy enough to carry. Elk had certainly carried dead deer that were heavier than she was. Elk scooted down the woodland trail with an easy grace, for a man who was so solidly built, and he made a quick shortcut through the woods to get back to his house. So there we are, that's the end of part three. Part four is tomorrow night. I look forward to you joining me then. Until next time, goodbye and good night.